air bars, you cannot use them in the fence line. If you have headphones, you cannot use them. Uh, if you have lights, please turn them on. And let's have a Right. That's why I want us to come here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good. Yes, This ride, I left Northampton. Uh, Paul and I was were gonna hook up, but I was running a little behind. So um, knowing that he had headed out to meet the bike barn, I went all the way out into the west side of town. We picked up the bike barn, and they headed out west. And all we did was looped around the west side of the city, cutting through a bunch of neighborhoods, which is what you kind of see here. Went to an area called Cypress. It was a good ride, it was quick, but I'm, the biggest thing I want to show in the clips is how to handle riding in the pace line with varying skill levels. And I hope you guys will enjoy the clips that we got for you. So we're just leaving the parking lot of the bike barn bike shop. And we're gonna head, we're gonna turn left to head west. East is to the right, north is straight ahead, we're going west. I had just rolled in the parking lot where you see the film begins with giving the instructions for their ride. They stop at every intersection and the person in front puts their foot down. Right here, the light turns yellow, we're already in the intersection. So we go ahead and all of us got through. If you see red, then you can wait because he even turned around to look. Make sure everybody made it right there. I basically rested this week. I had gone seven weeks in my macro cycle since hooking up with Team Ha Ha. And normally I do six weeks, so I needed a break. So I rested uh, this yeah, week. I, I was busy. As as normally yeah. I would and ride I every other day to spend. Not train, and but I, was I just took the time off. So this is my first ride since uh, uh, the, the last week. And so my plan so today was to just sit in and, and I ride along I got to the Catholic in the baseline school. without the spending the any okay. amount of energy yeah, I that I didn't have to. The Catholic school I to stay okay. between okay. June 1 and so June 2. I was, I was around that area at that time, oh. but I went straight uh -huh. on a stoop. But once I got the roads, I said, I think guys from Team R are probably just going to head ahead of them. It's just a good idea. I didn't know the route. the time trial from hell. Was held in the area called Huntsville, where Paul and I had ridden to in the winter. Very hilly area. And one of the guys said, Oh, it's fun. I think it must have been Victor who said it's fun. And I kind of chuckled because, and then, you know, from my background, time trials are not fun. When done properly, you turn yourself inside out. They're not fun. That's why it's called the race of truth. So when he said it was fun, I kind of chuckled because I'm like, You're not doing it right if it's fun. <laughs> a time trial is uh, a test of your fitness. You basically leave everything on the road. When you cross that line, you shouldn't be able to go any faster if you do it right. So, a lot of the stuff they're doing is new to them, and I'm like, in that, done that, not interested. I don't do things that other people are doing, I do things that's on my calendar, because I like to prepare for events, you guys know. We did the RDBC, we went out and trained the course for many weeks beforehand. So don't just jump onto an event because the mates are doing it. Make sure you're prepared for something similar yeah. and then you're able to tackle it. It's something you want to do. Don't get talking to it. 
everybody rides their bike for different reasons. So if it's not something you plan for, and, and they mention it, and you think you might want to do it, make sure you get the specifics, you know, the distance, the terrain, and make sure you can handle it. I don't do events on the wind. I like to be <laughs> I greet everybody when I came in there generally just uh, how are you all doing? So what Paul is talking about here is um, we, we come by and we visit a bike park from time to time. But people act really weird. It's like people you've had long conversations with and, and blah blah blah. You come back after a few weeks, they act like they don't know you. Yeah. And that's really too odd. So for me, my attitude is, I'll just ignore them. I'm here to ride, I don't care. You know, because there's quite a few people in this group that we know very well. We've had long conversations with them. Like the guy at the front right. And he acts like he's just seen us for the first time. Just real cool and stand up. I could care less. <laughs> I come and I say good morning. If you don't want to respond, that's your, that's your prerogative. That's a social thing, I greet people when I get there. The rest is up in the air. So, and you guys may have experienced it. Going through a neighborhood here, you see the houses are very large. It's kind of high rent district. This area is called Champions. I used to live out here a long time ago, not on this street, but close by. Uh, these houses are very, very nice, very private. A long time ago, this road was very, very quiet. So what they've done is, as the traffic has increased, they kept the speed down by posting 30, and it's heavily patrolled to make sure people don't fly through here. You can see people's driveway right on the street. This used to be very, there's a golf course on the left up across the street. So it's heavily patrolled by the constables to make sure these people slow down through here because you're passing right in front of people's homes. I personally have never cared for homes that order very busy streets like this. It's just the noise from cars and everything too close by. I like interior lots. But it's very pretty out here. Um, so when you ride in town, especially with a group like this, we pick up the lane. We have to. Uh, I think it's, it's better. So basically the two lines are the width of a car. So you don't have to be concerned about anybody trying to pass in this lane. Because these people do odd things sometimes. Sometimes really dumb things. So you don't give them the benefit of the doubt, just make it clear. That the road's all chewed up. You will see later in a little bit, I think I end up marking it. A lot of these guys like to say hole, and it's so ineffective. I've discussed that in other videos. Yelling hole is ineffective because the, the person's brain says, where's the hole? I will actually show you where they yell hole, and the person immediately behind them hits the hole. And then because, you know, yelling hole does nothing. If, if they had pointed, it ended up being Mary, uh, Theresa, the lady, the guy in front, the second rider on the right. I think she's in second position. Yeah, that, that's Theresa. We met her a long time ago. I didn't realize it was her throughout the ride because, I mean, she and I had chatted extensively in the past. And uh, she just seemed a bit preoccupied with other things today. So I didn't think it was her until we left the group and then we were talking and I mentioned 
And I think that person's Teresa. And Paul said, yeah, that was Teresa. So, I, because based on the fact that she was so standoffish acting like she didn't, the person acted like we hadn't been introduced. So I just presumed it wasn't Teresa that ended up being her. So, couldn't really figure it out, but uh, that's people are doing you see right here, as we in this, we're in two lines coming through, there is a railroad track coming. And I'm going to let people know, that's, that's it, I'm letting them know something's going to cross the road. You see, everybody does the same thing. The, the, those tracks ended up being just smooth. Did a very good job. I mean, it was so smooth. But I just stood up. I had it. Ride, I hang out at the back, most of it, pretty much all of it. I don't, I don't take a pull anymore. Um, it's not particularly super easy, but hanging out at the back, I don't have to be concerned with slowing another rider down or whatever. A lot of the guys behind me are less experienced and they choose to be there, so they're not in a hurry to get me at the front. You kind of gauge it, and sometimes I end up being the, the last rider in the bunch on purpose so that as we go through these intersections I don't have to accelerate as rapidly as the guys at the front because even though they're doing a lot of stops this ride is still challenging because at every intersection the light changes they accelerate back up to like 32 to 35k you do that for two hours that's a workout and that's how they make up for the fact that they don't have too many long stretches and you'll see that coming to play. And so since I'm taking it easy, I'm just monitoring my effort. And right here, I'm still in zone two, creeping up to zone three. So I move up and make sure I take advantage of the draft. Because I don't want to work hard today. that. So really the, the theory of the rest week is more for ment is for mental and physical recuperation because if you were to just do the same thing all year long it's easier to get tired of it or just plateau. By taking a rest week, it gives you a chance to I don't really want to use the word taper because you taper for an event. It gives you the work to build back up. You let your body go down and then you start like a new training period that's really what it is and i like that because it allows me to ride all year and not get sick of riding and then when i need to go hard i can the, the day after this ride i rode solo for about three hours just by myself just to make sure i kept the effort low. boys in the back just chilling we're just rolling out 14 minutes into the ride I rode from my house but I started the clips when I got to the bike park so the time the duration is actually reflective of the work this is highway 249 on the west side of town a little south of uh, Tom Ball, Texas. Oh, you can see Kurt at the front, they're accelerating back up the speed. I'm taking my time to roll in a good size gear. I'm probably sitting in a 19, a 53, 19, or 18. I've got an 18 on this wheel that's on the Colonago. That's a 1225. I use that. I'm pointing at that. That's a piece of concrete that dropped on the road when they worked on the road. And it's uncomfortable going over that. You can see how effective that is. I'm putting my hand out. It's an obstacle so people know to go away from my hand. And you'll see the difference when they yell hole because it does nothing for you. You're looking for the hole and you end up hitting it before 
So what I do when they yell, oh, I don't pay attention to it. I just follow them and hope that they're not going to ride into what they're yelling at. But, you know, like I've always stated, I'm not looking directly at the person in front of me. I'm looking around. It's a nice tight bunch right here. I kept my cadence very low the entire ride. That's intentional. I'll make a video talking about when to use high cadence, preferably, versus when you can use a lower cadence to your advantage. You know, there, there are times, that's why I like for people to be able to do all of it. I don't believe in just spinning at a very high cadence in a little gear. Whatever gear you ride, you should be able to spin it. video talking about high cadence versus low cadence and when to use the, to your advantage. Now, I don't know what these guys do. I know that for a fact they don't sprint. That's part of the announcement he usually makes. They don't encourage sprinting on their rides. And I'm sure they have a good reason for it. That's their thing. But then today's ride, they ended up sprinting. So we didn't know when they would sprint, when they wouldn't sprint. Didn't matter to me since I didn't plan on going hard anyway. But it was funny to see that they don't allow sprints, but then there are a few select people that choose to do it when they want to. So the rest of the group has no idea what they're doing. They don't know when they're going to sprint or when they're not going to sprint. Nice change to come and join these guys. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Team Aa was uh, not really together this weekend. They had people doing an event in Huntsville. We're turning right at the intersection. They had people doing an event in Huntsville, and then the rest of the people were not going to ride. And I just wanted to get something for the channel. So right here, the light's red, and you're going to watch, I still look before I turn, because you're responsible for your own safety. Don't count on, because the group goes, that nothing else changes. You know, traffic conditions can change. They turn, we didn't have the green light, so I checked. And sometimes, even if you have the green light, ride as if to say you're riding solo. Don't just do everything the group does without verifying that everything's okay. Because some people make poor decisions. And you'll see later in the ride, the ride leader makes what well, I call a lapse of judgment. It wasn't too, too bad, but whenever you make a decision that disrupts other road users, you know, it can be done better. And I'll just point that out. I did not warm up on this ride until two hours into it and when I told Paul about it he was laughing my body just felt like it was asleep so even though if you look at me you really can't tell Paul has mentioned that many times before but I tell him man I just wasn't feeling like I had good form or feeling smooth you know I didn't you know when you take a lot of time off the body gets what they call blocked up and so it takes a few rides for you to feel smooth so even though I'm riding and just muscle memory I feel, I just don't feel like everything's flowing as smoothly as it usually does when I'm really on my game. So, that's to be expected because I took over an entire block of five days. So it takes me usually a ride or two. But on this day, it was like two hours into it and I felt good after the stop. So I can still ride, but it just didn't feel the same. All I did was make sure I focused on keeping my effort down. You can see I'm still in zone one, creeping into zone two. Uh, Kurt spends a lot of time at the front in his ride in Eduardo, and that's what you would do. If you're riding in the city on a group like this and you want to work hard, 
you stay near the front and you take some pulls. That's how you would get your workout. There's a guy coming, there's a cyclist right there. And it looked like he was gonna come on the road. I had to call out to these guys, but he turned on the sidewalk. He must have been coming off of a trail. He's on like a mountain bike. Those are the things I look out for when I ride. That's why when I ride, I only ride. I read the road, I pay attention. Especially in the city, some of the roads chewed up. You know. They do that, they do a good job on this part of town, keeping it up. But deeper, closer to downtown, we got some real crappy roads. They even hard on the car. Houston soil moves a lot, so they pay the pavement cracks after a while. The shifting of the, of the soil causes that. Our mayor does his best to stay on top of that. That was one of the things he ran on, making sure that all the potholes were repaired timely. I look. Even though they're turning left, I still look. This is what I'm talking about. I don't begin my turn until after I look. That's what you need to do. Do not get complacent because you're in a group and take chances. Ride like you do when you're solo. Because things can change. The guys at the front may have had room and maybe the people in the back may run out of room if a car had appeared. The guy next to me dropped his phone. I'm not sure from where. Kirk is saying, oh, yeah. The guy back there in the Houston Astros cycling jersey. It's a baseball team. Then they had a cycling jersey out here. <laughs> seen one of those. Before. If you notice they're accelerating quickly, I'm taking my own time to get my gear rolling. I'm in a larger gear than I normally ride. I want to keep my effort down by not taxing my aerobic system too much. The reason I stay, I'm trying to stay towards the back. There are a bunch of guys just sitting behind us because they don't want to have anything to do with the front. But this way I just roll up to them at my convenience. Now, those three points I'm pointing out tells me this guy's experience. His shoulder is relaxed, his back is stable, and his cadence smooth. No rolling of the hips. So I spot that easily. That tells me this guy's very experienced. That's a sign of somebody who's dialed in. sits a little high in the front. The stem is kind of raised up. It looks like the angle, I can tell. So Carter's looking back here, and the road's gonna, the right lane ends. He should have gone, he didn't. Then at the last minute, he gets in front of this guy. This guy has to break. So I thank him, and we go, but it shouldn't have, he should have gone when he looked back initially, because then the guy would have just slowed down. At this point, we looked very erratic. So the guy is still there, we've come back over, he's not going to pass for a while because he doesn't think that we know what we're doing. So he sits back there and you'll see we go through this light and everything before he passes. But what he should have done was to go over initially when the guy was further back. So now the guy finally passes. And because if you cause him to stop like that, that means you did something to disrupt traffic. When he looked initially, there was enough room, especially considering that people following you. All of those decisions were like, that's what I was talking about. You know, it wasn't that bad, but I don't like to do that. I don't like to disrupt the other road users when I ride. So he should have put his hand out when he looked initially, let the guy know we're coming over, and the guy would have backed off the gas. Anyway, you know, no fuss, no 
us, but I just wanted to point that out. You have to make decisions for the whole group. He did okay there, but the way he went across it was as if to say he was riding alone. Because he was the only one that went across first. Until the guy slowed down. And if I'm doing something like that, I won't go across. I will put, put my arm out first. After the car slows down, then I will get in there. That, that acknowledges that he's seen the signal. So he really went over without signaling because we were running out of room. I think we waited too late to move over. Just pretty much all of us we should have moved over earlier. But more so the, the person at the front. That, that's the reason why you have to be alert even in a group. You know, people make decisions and sometimes it's not perfect. Going through a beautiful neighborhood here. Look at these trees. Very mature trees. I love that he's just trying now to keep more green around. You know, this city is so paved up. It's nice to see some trees. The trees do clean the air overnight. Because Kurt is sitting at the front for so long, if you notice his cadence is hot. It allows him to be the effort much more comfortable, especially with all the accelerations from all the stops. The bottom mechanic, that's what you want to do, kind of like if you do a criteria. This is almost like a criteria, not quite the intensity, but you're stopping and going all the time. You want to keep the cake. When you go in on a steady effort, you can roll a bigger gear. When it's steady, but when the speed is changing, He's waving. This guy thought he was getting in that lane to turn, but he's waving people through. He wants to come to the back. Uh, Paul and I are just hanging back. You know, we're not really trying to stay up there. So he gets behind these guys. We'll roll up to them a bit. You can see my club on the right. I'm trying to keep my effort. I'm, I'm watching my effort. I can tell by the field I'm creeping into tempo. I don't want to spend too much time in tempo. I want to rest. So I just do enough to get up there, get close to that guy, and just sit on him. You can see my heart rate immediately goes down below 150. That's the kind of stuff that I'm trying to stay with my plan. That's what I talk about. Everybody in the group has their own plan. My plan is to stay zone one, zone two. I fell back and I just sit there. This guy's spinning on the right, spinning on high cake. So it's perfect. I'm keeping my cake in moderate today, just kind of holding it. Putting out minimal effort. Body forgets very quickly. You take off a lot of days, you have to remind it. That's what I mean when you say when, when riders say I gotta find my form. That's what they're talking about. Right there. He said hole. She hit the hole. Ineffective. I stayed behind the wheel of this guy in front of me. So I missed the, the, hole. the hole. It's ineffective. Point to it. If you point to it, I will avoid your hand. I don't have to wonder where's the hole. By the time you say a hole, it's too late. Good thing it wasn't a real bad hole. Quite a few on this ride, but that I just pointed that out so you can see it. There's no point in doing all that yelling because she's right there. She heard it, but she couldn't do anything about it. The people in the back just hear a scream, a 
lot of it is unintelligible. It's windy. So they're wondering what is he saying. And then, you know, so it's like, slowing down. Stick your hand out. Because that slowing only works for the people near you. The rest of the people can't hear. Then we stop here and we start talking. I think he's sweating a lot. And I start telling him about why I'm wearing the bandana. But the sweat is burning his eyes. Your own sweat. <laughs> he said, Your own sweat burns your eyes. I told him it's the suck. I'm telling him about the bandana. Yeah, the bandana um, really works. I was skeptical because I, I tend to run hot, but uh, I'm convinced I like wearing them to keep the sweat out of your eyes. And I think I'm going to even wear them in the winter um, because I have a tendency to heat up under those cycling caps. Senor Cotto, you doing okay back there? There's a guy back there that's struggling. Um, he's off the back. And later on, I end up waiting for him. And that's the guy he's trying to check on. He ends up telling me that he had been off for six weeks. You know, you know, if you're off for six weeks, don't start with a group ride. Do a few rides by yourself first. Because this ride is not that hard. He's struggling. And the terrain is easy. So right here the road uh, goes single, we have to go single file, it narrows. I mean I saw that coming, that's why I was freewheeling for that guy to slip in. And you can see by staying uh, close to them, I'm keeping my effort down because I'm very close to this guy even though the speed has picked up. The wind is coming from the south, which is behind us, and from our left, which is from the west. And at a break, uh, I think at a traffic light, the ride leader ended up mentioning that's why they only do this route when the wind is from the southwest. Which I, you know, I thought that was kind of strange. You know, you're only gonna go west when the wind's coming from the west. But I'm sure there's a good reason for it. it. Makes sense. Sometimes you can start out riding into the wind and then have the tailwind to get you back. But for me, I don't I don't plan my routes based on the wind. I plan my routes based on how challenging I want the workout to be. Everybody's different. Every group is different, just like people. So you gotta find a group that works for you. I couldn't do these guys every week. That's why we visit them from time to time because they stop too much. Once I start to go, I want to keep going. Even if I'm riding in the city, I'm not going to unclip and put my foot down. If I get to the stop sign, nobody's there. And that's what they do. They go overboard, there, there, there's one spot you'll see, I even mentioned, I'm like, you know you can turn right on red, right, in Texas? Because he gets to a red light, and we're turning right, and then he stops and waits for the green light. I'm like, and there's nothing coming. So, that was weird. Like here, this intersection is a four-way stop sign in a, in, a, in a neighborhood, no cars there. I, I slow down, I look, nothing's coming, I'm going. I don't need to put my foot down. Now, if there's a car there, yeah, you stop. Unless they, if they wave you through, but at least you need to be going to where you're prepared to stop. But to have to unclip and put your foot down, that's a bit much. I do that if I'm going to stop and wait for a car to go through. There's another intersection. It's early Saturday morning. Everybody's sleeping. There's a four-way. So right there, that's all I would do with the guy in the black. I wouldn't put my foot down, I would do what he did and just go. Nothing's coming. 
and no officer will bother you. I've actually talked to them. They consider that okay for a cyclist. They're, they're more concerned about the ones that don't even slow down and just blow the stop sign, which is just not sensible in my opinion. You need to be prepared to stop, you need to check, make sure everything's safe, and there you go. Makes sense. Same thing you would do if you were walking. You know, so, just makes sense. You know, and they just choose to put their foot down. That's fine, it's not a problem. I'm just saying for me, if it's clear and nothing's there, that's like you're in the middle of nowhere, it's just you. When you put your foot down. So we're going left up here. There's a guy in the ride you'll see in a little bit. He even mentioned a guy who I, I, I spotted as an the experienced cyclist that I showed earlier. He comes on my right and he apologizes for making an illegal pass. And I just kind of shook my head. That's what happens. They consider, he, he the ride leader makes the announcement at the beginning of the ride that there's no passing on the right. Well, that doesn't prepare you for the real world of cycling. You go to an event, people will pass you on all sides. So telling somebody to not pass on the right, I think it's just not a good idea. Cyclists need to ride knowing that people can pass you on any side. So that if you change your line before you do, you need a check. So if telling somebody, oh, no, no passing on the right. Well, that's only going to work in this group. You go to a grand farm, though, people will pass you every which way. What are you going to do then? You're going to be yelling at people, oh, don't pass me on my right. Come on. You guys, those of you that compete, you're probably laughing. In a race, people pass you any which way. Whatever that space. So why prepare riders for an unreal cycling world, is what I call it. In the real world, people pass you all over. This guy at the front, I think this, this is where he's trying to tap out. He's sitting at the front, I think he, well, he's got some camera in his hand. The small little hero session. He's holding it. It's not attached to anything. Sitting at the front holding the camera like that. I'm like, I don't know. How much footage are you getting? Now he put it in his pocket. And Kurt goes to the front. In a little while, you'll see him try to tap out as the speed gets higher. He wants to get off the front and he's tapping for somebody to come around. Nobody wants to come around. You chose to be up there. You don't want to be there getting the back. I'm just sitting here chilling, really. I kept my cadence mostly in the 80s just to make sure my system did not have to work hard finishing out my recipe. It's hard to control that, especially if you get with a group that's going super hard and you may have to let them go if that happens. But for my level, I can sit in this group in zone 2. I just don't need a pull, that's all. I don't know what he's doing here. I'm very particular when I do hands-free. You guys that follow the channel, uh, I do it only when necessary if I'm trying to maybe, and it happens on this ride, I'm checking to see if my battery's in my kit. Uh, I keep my hands on the bars. I can do hands-free, but only when necessary if I want to put on something or change something without stopping and I make sure the conditions are right but it's usually when I'm out of by myself or off the back or off to the side you know to kind of like that in this group who are rolling you see when I do my hands free I'm checking right after the stop we're not going fast but once the group's moving avoid doing that especially if you're at the front there's no point to that A lot of these lights were kind of long, and I think this one was one of them. I believe it did not change for us. And where the light doesn't change, once the other traffic goes, if the left turn doesn't pick up bikes, you can see those cuts in the pavement, you see? They're not picking up bikes, so we go, because it's clear from the other direction. We sat there through a cycle of the whole chain cycle for the light and then we go and I just kind of casually roll whatever gear I'm in I'm not sprinting I'm not doing anything quick you can see I'm back in zone one after the stop that's it that's all I'm doing is just chilling and hanging out with these guys and enjoying their company you know. bar, bar. 
turning left, there's a car coming the opposite way. He slows down and lets us go, which I thought was nice, but, you know. So I thank him and I roll. And the ride leader said, make sure everybody gets, gets through. And I kind of mentioned to Paul, as he said that, he's riding pretty much at full speed up there. If you're not concerned about everybody getting through, then you soft pedal. You know, that's what Team RR does. You don't ride at full speed and say, make sure everybody gets through. Because when we get through, then we got to chase up to you. And there's a guy back there in a blue and white jersey that's struggling. You'll see him in a little while. I end up chatting with him. He asks some questions about training. And I go ahead and just give him general information. You know, tell him about the channel. I only talk to people about these kind of things when they ask. And since he asked, I just gave him some pointers. If he's interested, I told him, you want to get fast, that's where you go. The information's there. You know. So, information is power. The worst thing you can do to somebody is keep them ignorant. I mean, at 53.19 or something like that. I was just looking at the clip there. That's, I just On the flats, I just stay in that gear most of the time. And I may shift up to the 18. This wheel has an 18 on the cold mud. I hope we get a shot of my hand again. I want you guys to notice my fingers. This guy's short. He needs to get a new pair. That, what you're looking at there, the Lycra has worn away. And you can literally see through his shorts. <laughs> he got his money's worth out of him. <laughs> and the guy on the right, the experienced cyclist. <laughs> and that's another sign of an experienced cyclist. Well-worn equipment and, and kit. Yeah, but he, he needs to retire that bad boy. Because that patch is missing. The Lycra is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so. But those those things do last a long time if you take care of them. I don't keep mine that long. If they get to where they're like that, it's time to retire them. They've done their job, they've paid their dues. Just a lot of stops, just too many stops, you know. And, but the way they do it is after each stop, they kick it back up. Before you know it, you're at 32 kilometers an hour. So that does add up. If you're not in shape, you will feel it. If you notice, I'm hanging back to where I don't have to unclip. He unclips, he puts his foot down, then I get there. And I just keep rolling that little, that gear. That's all I'm doing. That's why I'm hanging at the back. That's another reason I'm hanging at the back. I don't have to unclip. If I were riding solo through here and the stop sign would come, I explained earlier, I would definitely slow down, be ready to stop, check. If there's nothing there, I'm going. If there's a car, then I will stop. It's kind of like being out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's there, it's just you. So. Like here, nothing's coming. Check, it's clear, you go. Because we have these signs in our neighborhood too. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the route, and I'm like, I wouldn't want to do this every week. I would do this maybe once in a while. But just too many stops. Yet another stop. That's the thing about riding in the subdivisions. They do this. The four-way stop signs are to slow traffic down. They don't want these guys cruising through here at high speeds. So they do that. They put these signs that keep to calm the traffic. 
So now, once we're approached, there's a road up there coming up, which is outside the subdivision, but kind of borders it. Doesn't have the stops, it's a, it's a faster road. And as soon as we turn on that road, I get closer to the bunch. So you need to be aware of that. Yeah. We're pretty much riding around in a circle, a yep. big circle. So right here, this is, uh, I believe this is Spring Cypress Road. Let's see that sign. Yeah, Spring Cypress Road. So we turn right, and I know this is a heavier volume of traffic road. It's, it's on the border of the sub. You see the fence on the right? It calms the noise from cars a little bit. They always put that. So I know they're going to pick up, and it's going to go for a while. So I roll up to get in the bunch. I'm in zone one right now, and all I want to do is use my energy staying in zone two to get up to that guy in the blue. That's all I'm doing. I'm not trying to get there right away. I'm just steadily going. And you can see my cadence in the 80s. Normally, I would be spinning at 95. And that's the thing with, with groups. So now I get up there, I can soft pedal, stop pedaling. Because it's definitely the yo yo effect. Always happening. It's a bunch of riders in this group that got nice dish carbon wheels, these deep dish wheels. Look like at least 40 millimeters or more. They're, def they're definitely improving the uh, technology of the carbon wheels. They're just a bit too pricey for the, how fragile they are. Guy in front on the in the chartreuse jersey, nice form. He's spinning really well, and I don't know if it's here, but when he does it, I will point it out in a little while. His hand, his left hand goes numb. Now, from looking at him, if he were in my studio, I would I would take a look at his cleats because if you're, I'm watching his hips. They're not rolling much. So his saddle position looks good. What that tells me is he's putting weight on his hands because of something going on either with his feet or the placement of those bars. There's a lot of pressure on that left hand. And, uh, I don't, he doesn't do it here, but as a part of the ride, we start to go hard and then he starts shaking his left hand. And that's usually when the pressure, when, whenever you're going hard, that's when anything wrong with your feet kicks in hard or you're going very long on a long run. But from looking at him, he looks very stable in the saddle, so I think his wrist is bent. Just from back here, I'm looking at him. But it's really easy to diagnose when you know what to look for. And then some people just end up living with that. I, I can't tell you how many riders on this ride were shaking their hands. One guy stood up and shook both of his hands. You know, hands free and just shook both of his wrists. Like, that's not normal. Something's wrong. The guy back there that's hanging off the back is struggling. The guy who had mentioned that had been, uh, said he hadn't been riding for six weeks. I don't know if it's here where we end up waiting for him, but uh, I'm behind Paul at this point. I'm drifting more to the back just to keep my effort. You see, my, uh, they're going pretty fast, so my effort is creeping up into tempo. And I'm trying to just keep my acceleration. Yeah, there. That's the, that's the hand movement right there. His hands numb, right there. So that tells me the bars are hitting him early. The stem might be high or short. You know, it's very very hard to diagnose. 
So if you don't know what you're doing, you can spend a lot of money. We had a legend this week, a new legend. He's been posting comments. I'm not going to call his name. He knows who he is. He ended up buying a stem because he's all oh, the stem I have, they be short. And I'm thinking, what made you think it's short? You got to know what you're doing before you buy stuff. You got to, it, it needs to be a systematic approach. You need to check your saddle height. You get your inseam saddle height before you make any changes. You got to know where you're, where you're starting with and where you're going to. So just, just resist the urge to just be making arbitrary changes. Otherwise, you won't know when to stop. You got to be solving a problem and it needs to be a systematic approach. Then you'll know when you've arrived. You got to have a destination. We're turning left here. I went ahead and edited this for time, this light was very long, and so we rolled through this intersection. Everybody seemed to be interested in the camera as usual. Some of the same guys we talked to months ago want to ask about, oh, where are you going to post this and all that. At this point, I could have cared less. You know, one of them I just said, there's the name on his shirt, you know. If you really wanted to know, you've been told before. I, I remember who we've told. If we've told you before, you didn't act on it. Don't ask me today. You're not interested. People who want information, seek it out. So right here, this guy's leaving a gap. I don't know why. So I just roll around him. I know it's going to go because this road does not have a stop right now. And they're going to pick up the speed. We're already doing 37 kilometers an hour. But that's what it took for me to catch them. So they're doing 34. So he left the gap, I went around him, Paul is right behind me. If you leave too much of a gap at the back, you have to work hard to close. It's not easy at the back. The reason I'm there is I can dose out my effort. I don't have to be reacting to try to keep things tight. So I'm just carrying my speed here. They're slowing down. You can see my cadence is low. I'm just kind of rolling the gear. This guy waved me. Now I can see why his hand is numb. Look at his wrist. Look how bent it is on the top, right there. It should not be that bent. The wrist should be straight. It's cutting off his circulation. So the bars are too high, and then my, and the stem might be short. They don't put this in books. All of this stuff comes from experience. You got to be able to spot it. I did Frankie's fit a while back. Somebody asked me, how did you know to go down five millimeters and how much to go back or whatever? I told him just experience. I don't care what you use, whether you use fit kit, grid tool, you need to know what changes need to be made based on feedback from the person. There's no computer system that can outdo an experienced fitter. I've had guys go to those fittings where they put electrodes all over your body and then they come back and like <laughs> making changes to it and say this stuff doesn't work because they didn't ask you. The computer doesn't know you. They have ranges and ranges don't apply to everybody. You fall somewhere in the range. They got to find where you fall. And the only way you find that is your body telling you, yeah, that feels good. So it is. Fit is what you feel. As you ride longer and longer, the little things you get away with become big problems. See my hands on the bars? Look at my fingers under there. Just, just laying there. I'm not grabbing the bars. I'm just resting on them. And my wrist is straight. It's not bent. It's a good shot there. Your fingers should just drape the side of your bones. So you're using no energy. 
Anytime you got to grab something, it takes energy. You don't need to grab anything. You just rest on the bars. The bike tracks. Right here, the power is on. And I just move up to get behind this guy in a white jersey. Gradually, because... I'm right on the top of zone 2. I don't want to go much further into tempo. Sometimes you have to. If it's for a short time, it doesn't matter. But you can see that I'm pressing on the pedals here. We're going into the wind. And there was a slight grade. It wasn't much. You know, this is, the whole ride was flat. That's the thing about this course. Soon as you start to ride hard, you come to an intersection. But if you're not fit and then the, the intersection clears or they're ready to go and you, you haven't caught your breath, it can be hard. That's what's happening at the back of the pack. And this road, I believe, is the Spring Cypress again. It narrows into... I don't know if it's here, but it ends up narrowing. It was a faster road, so I stayed close. See? And now he's looking. So now it's clear. See? Now he did that right. That's what I'm talking about. That's what he should have done when that road narrowed earlier. I know the area, but when we're riding here, I have no idea what these other little roads are. It's just cutting through. Neighborhood. We're going to go left here, then right, and we'll follow it. Okay. He's giving that guy directions. So that guy's going to sit at the front for a bit. This is a short light. It goes red as we turn. The only thing is that we're already now. He's looking to make sure everybody made it. And he's waving people up. Paul's up here. You can see Paul's shadow on the road there. I'm just behind, just taking my time out of you know, I didn't want to ride hard today. I had to work to stay at the back because everybody else wanted to stay at the back. <laughs> and it's funny because the back is not easy. Because these guys up here, um, my speed's like in the 20s, it's going up to 30 now. These guys are already at speed. If you're at the back, you gotta go faster than them. You know, the only cool thing is that this group does not have, you know, anything goes. They kind of keep the speed governed. But if they're doing 40 kilometers an hour, you have to do 45 to catch them in a reasonable amount of time. So if you're hanging around at the back, you better stay tight. Because that yo-yo effect plays a game and you end up actually working harder than the guys who are further up the line. I sit at the back just so I can take my time getting up to speed, but I still stay within contact. And some of the riders on the ride will leave gaps and then they end up getting dropped easily, but they're banking on the fact that this group is governed so they don't go very hard or very fast. So they have like a top speed. That's what they bang. This is a two-lane road, so we're single file here. So if you want to benefit from the draft, you get closer to the rider in front of you. If there's stuff going on like the speed's changing or traffic conditions are causing you to slow down and you leave a little bit more room so you don't have to be on your brakes. That's kind of what you're seeing here. But actually right here, it gets a little tighter. Those two guys at the front are changing positions. That's Eduardo in second place there. That's Teresa behind Eduardo. So 
Kurtz behind the guy in the Astros jersey. I didn't know they had Astros cycling jersey. That's a nice twist. Probably after their world championship win, they made that. I figured they would sell something. Houston Astros, World Series champs. You saw this guy firmly point at that obstacle. So that helped all avoid the obstacle. I'm back there at this point. I am sitting where this guy is. I'm not anywhere near the rock because it's all chewed up. And then about here it clears up and then I move to the right. So I'm always looking around to see what's coming. Don't depend on the warnings. Hear the wind. This is where we uh, stop. I had no idea where it was, it didn't matter to me, I had plenty of fluids and everything. I carry enough to go two hours before I need to stop. And they're stopping at an hour 28, the time you see up there, that's the actual duration of the ride with them. I've been riding for about two hours since I broke from the house. Looks like a McDonald's. It's a, it was a nice stop, they had restaurants and everything. The, the, the part of town we're in is called Northwest Harris County, Cypress. That's the guy in the blue and white. He starts to ask me about, I don't know what made him ask me, but I guess. It's after he tells me he's been off the bike for six weeks. And I told him about the channel and then told him about periodization training. What we're talking about there. The guy in the blue shirt is listening in. <laughs> Even though I'm talking to that guy. And I told him just go to the channel, the information's there. You know. You can't give away stuff uh, unless somebody's ready to receive it. There's no point in bringing it up. Alright. Let's go. We're heading out, uh, some of the guys are trickling out. At this point in the ride, I finally feel like I'm warmed up. My body has finally decided that <laughs> I should uh, feel like a cyclist again after the whole week off. I don't feel blocked up anymore. But I want to not ride hard, not today. But I have a full week of rest. That's why I'm up there trying to stay in the draft. Paul's riding up. He's going to catch up. We're, we're doing about 18 miles an hour right there. He'll catch up easily. And if you look at my RPMs, there's a lot of pedal, pedal, and then stop. You, know, you see it going back down. Our sink has been resolved. Uh, Garmin finally get, got the map working so everything's perfect. Google is charging people for using their maps now. They changed it put in place. You can see how that works. And some people are going to use other services. But mostly developers. Right about here, I think I start to ask Paul whether he saw me put my battery right there. Ask him if he saw me put my battery in there. So I decided to go ahead and check it. We're not really riding yet. The bike is there, but I didn't see you put it in. He said he didn't see me put the battery. I want to make sure I didn't leave the spare battery for the camera. We switched the battery at the stop. Yeah. 
So I open the bag while I'm riding. Some of the riders will come around me. I check. It's there. Okay. They take any time and I put it back. You should be able to do stuff like that. If you can't ride hands free, you gotta practice that. I spend a lot of time on the bike. Monitoring my effort the whole time. I'm not looking at the heart rate meter all the time because I don't really have it. I think it's way down on my displays. You know, I, I, I show cadence more than anything. But what I do is I pay attention to the feet. I can tell when I'm going hard. RPE more than anything else. Some guy came to the channel, he asked, he said he really liked the display, he liked the narration, <laughs> the group right. And he said, uh, how, and, and, you know, how about a, consider getting a watt meter? And so I told him, as a power meter, so we call it watt meter. Technically, that's what it is. So I told him, I said, it's not in the budget at this time. I haven't had a power meter. I wasn't that thrilled with it. It was a big headache because the wheel was <laughs> psychological real G3. Kept crapping out on me every few rides. You had to take out the battery. And then you're stuck with one wheel. You have to care for that. But um, there are other things on the market now. It's just not in the budget at this time. It's not a need. Uh, there's another display. And you know, it just says, oh, you're doing 300 watts. So, you know, if I'm going fast enough, I'm at the front. If I'm not, I'm off the back. So, yeah, some people use it as a training tool or a pacing tool, and I think it can be effective. But uh, I don't, even when I had it, I didn't use it that much because I don't like to feel like I'm in a lab. I'll, I'll ride by feel more than anything. Even when I used to do time trials, I just went as hard as I could go. That's it. Go hard. I'm sure it can help you if you're using numbers, but you still have to work with it enough to know, okay, I'm just going to try to hold this number. It has its merits, but uh, I'm looking for something that will be portable and not a, you know, I'm not looking at any of the pedal based stuff now because the, the system, the, the cleats are too small. I like the Shimano platform. That's the so, other ones that are out there are out there affordable. It's not a just a nice step. I ended up uh, speeding this up. I believe I edited the time is like very long. In fact, it did not change. And we're turning left, and there are a couple of cars that wait for us. I thought it was kind of cool, but that was kind of odd to turn when we did. Normally, I would wait till those guys were gone. Because there were only two cars. So, yeah, in the future, we will add a power meter when I can find one that is uh, portable. It doesn't interfere with me. I don't like putting too much crap on my bike. So I like to keep the bike simple. So... As I said earlier, I was hoping Shimano would come up with a pedal-based power meter system. That would be ideal for me. But I am not wearing any look. That would be good thing to give me my feet. They're too small. Make them bigger. I like the idea of pedal-based power meters. It makes sense. It's just to limit them to one heat system. What I find odd. Maybe it's a licensing issue with Shimano. Special 
care keep my heart rate mostly in zone 2 or less during this ride uh, towards the end of the ride it crept up into the top of the tempo but just for a short time but I accomplished what I needed to it was so humid at the end of the ride my jersey was completely soaked Team kit is a summer jersey. It's got vents in the back and whatever, but still, it's just amazing that you hit it. left wearing no gloves I only do that when I ride solo sometimes but in fact uh, during the summer I wear more gloves than anything because of this especially with our team kit the gloves are very comfortable but in a group whenever I ride other cyclists I prefer to just wear gloves just in case there's a mishap and something happens at least you got something to keep between your hands and wherever you might fall Right here, the leader and Eduardo decide they're going to sprint, and I'm surprised. I'm like, I thought there was no sprinting in this group. <laughs> so, I guess we didn't get the memo. I'm just staying on this guy's wheel. I'm not sprinting. I think this is where I crept into tempo. And and so after they do that, he the leader backs off. He's in front of the guy in the chartreuse jersey. That's Kurt. And then three other guys continue to go. All I do is sit in the draft because I don't want to expend too much energy. There they are, they're just going. Well, there's an intersection, maybe 300 yards down the road. Not, not, not much. I don't change my effort. My effort's coming back down. In fact, yeah, I'm just sitting. Whatever they're doing, I'm like, that's fine. So let's say you don't allow sprinting and then you sprint. It's like, okay, does the rule only apply to what or when do we sprint? I know what's the signal if other people want to participate. So it, it, it happened quite a bit on the ride. It was kind of odd. We kind of chuckled. Me out. Those guys want to, they want to sprint. That's just it. You get fitter, you want to go faster. You're holding it back. Made up rule. So you need to look for a group that fits your need. If you want a group that restricts you, then you find one. And this group is not too bad, but nothing like what Node was talking about, group Nazi. Uh, but it's just that they say they don't encourage sprinting, but then they do. So how do you know when it's okay and when it's not? I think this is where he said, uh, Kurt said that that's why they do this route, because we got a tailwind. That's another reason they're sprinting. Of course, same difference. It's that I got a smile on. What it is. This construction here, I end up jumping some of these crevices. They're right there, another guy jumped into There's a big hole there. side of town a lot of these roads they cannot handle the volume of traffic they're trying to. this is where he ends up stopping where uh, in Texas I believe California a bunch of states you can turn right on red they stop nothing's coming but we just sit there I'm like 
Okay, what is this? Did they need a break? Green. I think they needed the rest. So now he's at green. <laughs> so I told Pazzi, you know you can turn right on red in Texas. All laughs. <laughs> Paul's laughing. We, we shared a joke. They tell you to turn around and rest off. I think they needed a break from their sprint. This is the guy in the blue jersey that's been struggling. Off the back there, he said he hadn't been riding for six weeks. Just enough to just stay on the wheels, as we call it. Because from now until the end of September, the next six weeks, I'm going to be building back up. That's my next macro cycle. I got the full effect of the rest week. So yeah, you can rest and still ride. Do that by making sure you just keep your effort down. I think that light on the, the guy on the right um, is a flare. It's called a bump rigger flare or something. It has an unusual beam pattern. of the ride I'm just sitting in the back I think near here we go through an area where you know, it's here we start to smell gas or something it may not be here it may not have been here we're coming here and I think yeah, we've already passed the area where it's just almost like there was a gas leak you could smell you know, like eggs and going you know, bad eggs sour eggs or rotten eggs as that smell this is 249, we're south of Palm Ball, we're headed east. We have a southwesterly flow of wind. So the wind's behind us and we're running. So right here they start the sprint and everybody's excited. They got the tailwind. They, they did a little sprint earlier, so now they're excited. I just stay at the back. My effort, try to keep my effort. Paul is up here with me. Behind all of them. Bump right there. A lot of those that are not too bad, you just stand. You get your bike free to go. Kind of blue struggling a bit. You just sit out. It's really simple. Because there are a bunch of intersections coming up. You're quite killing yourself. In a little while, some genius driver is somewhere coming up here. Wants to get in the right lane, like, if he doesn't get in the right lane today, his head will explode. Even if he were turning at the upcoming light, he could have gotten behind us. But no, he comes up, throws a signal, and then wants to have an attitude when there's not enough room for him to get in. Riding in the city, you gotta read the road. There are a lot of cracked pavement, or whatever, more so than out of town. This stretch is not too bad. I think it's right around here, it's coming up. He's gonna be in the left lane, he's gonna signal and expect us to slow for him. I end up freezing frame just to show. See that driver up there way ahead signals and gets in the right lane. There's a light coming up maybe 300 yards or something like that. Now we're slowing down for the stop sign. This genius right there, right here. I froze it so you'd see. He's got a signal on trying to sneak in front. Right there. 
what's the use for that? Let him sit there. Let him go. Keep going. And he's not even turning at the light right here. What is the rush? Go behind the cyclist. That's what Paul is saying. Just go behind the cyclist. What you, what's the rush? He's not turning at it. Even if you were, you get you behind the car. Yeah. I know. It's like, dude, just hang out. That's what Paul and Kurt are talking about. There he is. He's not even turning over there. They do that stuff even when you're in your car. If I don't get in front of you, like the world would end. You can have all the space behind you to want to cut in front of you. That's why they have all these problems on the road. Nah. They don't want to call it road rage. It's not the road that has a rage. It's the people on the road. Do it fast. Do it fast. So he's, oh he's coming to get in his lane to come Free. up here. You know, what was the rush? There was no rush. So I shortened this over here too because this light was kind of long. And I sped it just to kind of a con. But the city riding, that's it. If you stop. Now what happens with these guys, after each stop, they kick it up. So you can get a workout. Between those lights, you kick it up. You get your workout. You don't have to go out of town and get in shape. Just in the city, there's more people using the world, so your position can I'm way back there. I believe that uh, a little while for the arrow behind the guy. Right, right there. Go ahead. Rolling my gear, taking my time. We're doing about 40 kilometers an hour. I'm trying to make sure my effort stays low. Behind the guy in the front. There's another rider behind him, the guy in the middle of one. And he, he said he hadn't been training, but then he spent all his time a car length behind the group. He can't do that. Oh. You're out of shape, you got to draft even better. shot of how we hold the gimbal. Let's see my good shot. Just right next to the brake hoods. All these guys with their stems way up in there. Hands on. So when your hands are getting numb that means you're putting too much weight on it. And it could be because you don't have enough weight on the saddle. Not comfortable there. The cockpit will never be comfortable. You can change them to whatever you want. You still won't be able to be comfortable. You gotta make sure that your saddle and your feet are comfortable. That's where the weight is. Then you can unweight the bar. I think he needs to lower his stem right here. This is the guy with a numb left hand. I think too many spaces are under that stem. Everybody thinks that sitting up high makes you more comfortable. <laughs> so try picking up a heavy load without bending the knees. You'll see. These two guys decide to sprint up here. That's Kurt on the left, the ride leader, and this guy on the right, I don't know his name. But then the guy on the right stops. <laughs> I guess it got, it got too fast for him. We got the wind behind us, really not hard at these speeds. It's not perfect till we so Kurt continues to go. This guy falls off the base. I think this is Oscar behind him. But, you know, I don't really know. They, I don't know if that's a sprint or just, he just sped up. I would consider it just, he just changed the pace. I wouldn't call that a sprint. So while they're doing this, everybody else is falling off the base. I pick my way around them. Short while you will see me on the tip of the intersection because I end up going around and a lot of the riders are on the left huge gap. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's go back. That's one of the mortars playing music. So, um, I don't know what you guys got to do on Saturday, guys and girls, but this is what we did. Um, our rest week is over. Now I can. Uh, 
to get back into my next block of training. And so I made my way around all those guys when they were sprinting. And I think right around here, right there, yeah. Coming to the picture. So, get your K's in and don't let anything stop you. 